Hi, besties. I have a really fun guest joining me today. I have Coco Moco, and you should know who she is on TikTok, on Instagram, her podcast, Ahead of the Curve. She is just an all-around media expert, um, and I happened to meet you, Coco, at uh, the part one of the Vanderpump Rules reunion watch party at Junkyard Dog. Isn't that the name of it? Yeah. That was yes. It. That was, I was there alone and then your friends invited me over and it was like so nice. And, you know, I had so much fun sitting next to you because your commentary just, you know, the little things that you would notice during the reunion, I was like, oh my God, I need to have this girl come on here um, and just talk about just everything happening. Um, and it's also kind of funny because again, this was, oh my God, that was back in May. I know. <sighs> and it's like almost fall. I can't believe this is happening. Um, and you and I had been going back and forth like, yeah, we're, we'll try and schedule for you to come on. And literally, I, I it was the night before. <laughs> I go, okay, Coco, we're going to do this. Let's talk about this theory and idea I have about the whole Scandaval thing. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone is just starting to turn their thoughts on whether or not they, you know, are having empathy for Rachel. And literally the next morning, I, it's hard to call it the reality reckoning. I kind of want to call it the Bethaning because that's what I feel yeah. it turned into. It was the very yeah. next day. So did yeah. you listen to these episodes? I'm sure you did. Yeah, I did. Um, it was even like, side note, it was just odd to like try and track it because it was like the way it was uploaded and there was like a lot of ads. So I did listen to it. It was a little difficult as a, as a listener to like maneuver, but it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so many thoughts. Well, yeah. And that's the other thing that was the ads. They were jarring. I felt like, um, there, yeah. there just was no segue. <laughs> I know. Like, what? Especially, like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Especially cause I mean, I, and, and I think it, what's so interesting about this pod is like, to me and what we're going to talk about is like Bethany is so interesting to me because like I agree with her on so many things and then like in some ways I don't and I think this podcast was the perfect example of that where there were mm -hmm. some ways where I was like finally someone's you know kind of getting Raquel's side and then there were some times where I'm like ah oh, like I don't know it's like it it was the delivery right I don't know so absolutely um full agreement because about how Bethany it's like she can be polarizing and then she also there are things that she was right about. Like, I think we're mm -hmm. all in agreement that reality stars deserve to be part of a union. They, I mean, yeah. there is a certain level ex of exploitation. And then it was like, but you're exploiting her. And it's very clearly like your agenda. Yeah. Um, and something else about just letting all of you, if you haven't seen Coco before, she is very good at accurately. We're just going to say not very good. She uh. accurately predicts the mm -hmm. rising stars. She knows what's happening and you just, something about you have a knowing. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're going to call Thank it. <laughs> knowing you. and a skill to it. Yes. And I have, I'm going to have some questions for you regarding your thoughts, especially when it comes to the reality reckoning, because listen, I, and I've said this to my listeners and some of my followers that I am, I'm going to be changing the name of what I'm doing just because I'm like, I cannot have my entire brand associated with someone else that I, that they can kind of be in charge of the behavior and what, what happens and what comes of my own brand. So I need to just be in charge of my own. So that's going to be happening. I keep trying to warn everyone so that it's not like, Jordan. Oh my God, where did she go? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's yeah. A thing. Um, so the first thing I do kind of want to jump into, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of going a little bit all over the place. This again has been a conversation that I've just been waiting to have and it's, it's finally happening. Okay. I personally am seeing a lot of parallels between the Monica Lewinsky and we're going to call it the Clinton scandal, not the Monica Lewinsky scandal or the Lewinsky Clinton scandal, but we're going to call it the Clinton scandal because we're putting it on the man. Okay. Let's be real here. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really was kind of diving into the 1997 of it all for a, a few days here. And, you know, the biggest takeaway I just want to start with here is how the women just tend to get the brunt of it all. Um, I think we all know that, right? But the way 
Tom Sandoval was able to go on his quote unquote tour of the country with his band. What do you see happening for Tom Sandoval and we'll say his quote unquote star, <laughs> especially if Vanderpump Rules is done after season 11? What do you see for him personally? Right. Um, I think that he, I mean, even the fact that him and Schwartz so soon after the scandal um, booked other reality shows, I think was really interesting. I think that they're just, well, one, I think Sandoval will always um, be in the reality sphere, I think in a way. Um, and I think this goes for some of the cast especially the ones that were on since season one, like I think Sheena, Katie kind of, but I don't think Katie seems to want to always be in the public eye, but they're, they're media trained. They're in a way they're legacy stars. Um, like they, whether you love or hate them and when season 11 ends, if it fully ends the show, I don't think it will now because of the ratings juggernaut that mm -hmm. it became, but um I think that Sandoval will always be, I could see him going into like hosting. I think that he likes mm -hmm. to have that control. Um, I know uh, Raquel Rachel also talked about him um, kind of trying to backdoor a producer um, role as well. So mm -hmm. I could see Sandoval going into more of a hosting role. Um, mm -hmm. I think he would like love having that kind of um, being able to have that power, kind of like an Andy Power. Cohen in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in a weird way, he's really charming. Um, and, and, but, and the, yeah, so that's what I think I could see Sandoval going into. I think oddly now, as much as Ariana's star rises, like her going on Dancing with the Stars, Sandoval is always going to be tied to her. So he's always going to rise with her. Like, you know, it, and like, mm -hmm. I think Bethany even used the analogy as the tides rise, so do the ships. I think him yeah. and Ariana's ships will always be tied together. So however famous Ariana becomes, Sandoval's always going to be right there next to her. Mm -hmm. That is such a great, see this, friends, this is why I'm telling you. <laughs> I just couldn't wait to like pick Coco's brain on this. Like I'm still, I'm going, like I said before, I'm going a little back and forth on a few different things here, but that's, I could absolutely see him doing that. And I don't know why it immediately popped into my head. Two different things were, I could see him hosting Big Brother that he would love to try and hold other people accountable because that was his thing. He, that's, yeah. that's why part of why part of why this became such a huge thing to all of us who have been watching from day one we were like excuse me you are the accountability police here and yeah. now it's you dude mm -hmm. or even like if i oh my gosh i forgot his last name but tj from the challenge i could see yeah. sandoval going and doing that that is such I, I, that's a fascinating thought because here was the thing that i Really, as I was reading everything about, for example, Monica Lewinsky, and there's, I'm going to get to the point of the biggest difference between Rachel and Monica. So I want you to know, friends, that one, um, Monica, she keeps getting brought up throughout the years, but we are going to do it in a gentle way because um, mm -hmm. it's a different situation than even this was. Um, so looking at her on Wikipedia, on Britannica, all of it, there were things that I forgot she went through after all of this happened after the impeachment. She went and she was trying to, she not trying to, she was designing handbags. She moved to London, was working on this handbag line, and she had it going for, I believe it was like three, maybe three to five years. And there were a lot of facts here. Um, then she became a spokesperson for Jenny Craig, and she was required to lose 40 pounds in six months in order to remain their spokesperson. Yes, that is not healthy. <laughs> Um, and that goes along with the way the public was shaming her, body shaming the hell out of her. And now looking at her, I'm like, was she even a size 10? She was small. It was wild what was happening then. So there, there are so many things that are different that she went through that Rachel didn't go through. Okay. But this is what I also forgot was that uh, and it seems weird that I would forget that the internet was around in 1997, 98. It's like, it seems like mm -hmm. it was something that only happened in the millennium, right? Um, so with that, then she um, lost out on the full $1 million Jenny Craig deal because Jenny Craig received a lot of backlash. And so she only, they dropped the commercials and started airing old ones. And so she only made like $300,000 for it. She then went, um, yeah, it, she, I mean, it's just, she goes and gets her master's uh, in London. 
Then she comes back to the U.S. and is trying to get jobs. People won't hire her. And they, they would say things like, because of your history and things like that. Well, then she would be considered for jobs, but they'd say, well, we expect you to show up at these charity functions. She was trying to work for nonprofits and things like this, okay? So then they'd be like, well, we expect you to be talking to the press then. And she's like, I don't want to be talking to the press. She ends up starting her own production company. As we all know, she was a part of, she was an executive producer, had that credit on American Crime Story uh, impeachment that was... um, Oh my gosh, Ryan Murphy's production as well. So she's been able to finally make this slight turnaround. Something else that's interesting is this year was the 25th anniversary of it all. So, I mean, in this was, she put out an article in Vanity Fair. Uh, she's a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. And the article came out, I believe, on like January 3rd of this year. And what, like two months later, this scandal happens. So there, the the first thing that, really sparked my thought on Monica and Rachel's parallels was the fact that Rachel is in that blue dress, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in those confessionals at the end. And it was something about her at that moment. I said, I felt like she, at those last five minutes on part three, I felt like she looked like a little girl and it just broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people were like, still really coming down hard on her. I'm after this I just want to call it the Bethaning. I just can't call it anything else now that it's. <laughs> I feel like a lot of that was undone and people had finally started leaving her alone. And I felt like she could have had the Monica Lewinsky turnaround um, had this podcast not come out. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, I would like to know, aside from the, we're going to say clunkiness of how it all went. Um, and I feel like the pot calling the kettle black because I'm a little clunky on this one today. Um, trying to remember the thoughts I've had stewing for however many months now. Um, your thoughts on this podcast episode. Now, we know Rachel went to seek mental health treatment, which, again, that was where I'm like, hey, let's, let's leave the girl alone. And a lot of people finally were saying that. I just can't get over it. Um, What did you think when it came down to when Bethany would kind of try and prompt her about, you know, well, you know, so you had an affair. This guy wasn't married. He didn't have kids. Do you think that Bethany was actually trying to help her or hurt her whenever she was setting, teeing this up? Was she producing her the same way that she's accusing producers on Bravo of producing her? If this question makes any sense at this point. Yeah. No, I think you're doing a great job of articulating it all. And I think that with Bethany, when I was listening to the pod, I really wanted it to be about Rachel Raquel, but it was more so about Bethany. And what kind of stopped me in my tracks was when Bethany said, well, I I haven't even really seen the show. And I was like, what? Like, it would only take someone who, and, and I mean, there's so many people who have seen VPR. Like it has a, a, my, yeah. my little sister, it's intergenerational. My little sister's in high school. Maybe she's like too young, but she has, she always has the VPR on her phone and she's just rewatching seasons. Like it, there's so many people who would understand the nuances mm-hmm. of the dynamics that happen, the ways in which maybe Raquel Rachel was wrong and the ways in which maybe she was wronged. And it would have took someone who had actually seen the show to articulate that. Um, and so I thought it was odd when she said, like, she hadn't really seen the show. I was like, okay, well, that uh, that explains why this interview, I think, was more about Bethany. Um, mm-hmm. And also a note, too, like you were saying in the, um, where you said she kind of seemed like that, like a child in the last five minutes. Um, yeah, I wanted to add to, I think, the moment that it kind of switched for me where, um, it was like, you know, everyone like gung ho against Rachel Raquel, um, which obviously she made mistakes, but then, um, an interview came out with the producer of VPR. He had been producing it for the, since the, the beginning. And he said in the interview that sometimes they struggled with, um, whether they wanted to air certain things because of how oddly childlike Raquel was. 
And that made me mm-hmm. wonder if they were referring to maybe they thought there was something going on with her that like, if, if there is like, you never know. So I'm not going to speculate, mm-hmm. but like that maybe she can't process certain things that are going on and it makes her more susceptible to the producers, to mm-hmm. someone like Bethany, um, to a Tom Sandoval. And obviously she's a grown woman and she's making her own decisions. But I did think that was interesting that the producer even said that they struggled with whether they did end up wanting to air certain things because of they were worried about how childlike her, you know, mental process Neither. seemed mm-hmm. to be. Um, I think that yes. came through in the Bethany interview as well. Absolutely. And I, I wish I could remember exactly who said this. So I apologize, whoever said this, if I'm not crediting you, but I think a lot of people did say this, which is that Rachel went and did all of this work to try and really unearth everything deep within her that Mm -hmm. caused her to fall prey to this, whether it be for other reasons that, uh, you know, we're not going to speculate on or what was deep within her that in her, in her own words made her go after unavailable men. And then Bethany essentially in one fail swoop undoes all of this by basically telling her it wasn't a big deal. Now, I know everyone keeps saying this. There's always going to be this person or persons in the comments. Do you know how many people are cheated on all the time? People get cheated on every day. Yes, got it. We, we're, we're aware of that. <laughs> now, the, the other thing is we also know had this been done to Bethany, if Bethany had been Ariana, dear Lord. <laughs> My God. Just, could you imagine? I, it, yeah. Because... <laughs> The verbal abuse that, yes, Rachel, the things when you heard them read back, it was like, oh my God. Yeah. It was bad. Yeah. And I wonder too if maybe I'm kind of like speculating here. And again, it's weird because in so many ways, I agree with Bethany, like the reality union. And I think that, you know, she's pretty business savvy. And, um, and then there's ways in which I think she like really seems to miss the point. But, Um, in the interview, I felt like Bethany a couple times kept trying to hammer kind of how she was on one of the biggest shows on Bravo and she's always been one of the highest paid stars and they're begging her to come back and she didn't. And there's a clause because of her, the Bethany clause, like she always talks about that. And I almost wonder too, if her alignment with Raquel is more so rooted in her resentment towards Ariana now being one of the biggest stars from Bravo and Ariana getting opportunities that only a handful of other Bravo stars have gotten like Dance with the Stars. I think Nene Leakes was on it, but I almost Mm -hmm. wonder if Bethany and Kenya Mm -hmm. and yeah. And I almost felt like Bethany was hammering because she probably knew Ariana might listen. Like I'm the one that there's a reason there's a Bethany clause. I was on one of the highest watched shows. I had one of the highest rated shows. You know, she kept kind of, I was like, in that mm. moment, I was like, why does she keep saying this? But then I'm like, oh, I wonder if she's resentful towards Ariana. I could see that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, she that's the thing, too, is the people who are the loudest about their own achievements are the most insecure in them, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with being now. Let me also when someone like Bethany, we know she has worked very hard. She has yeah, built her business hustler. from the ground up. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm not negating what she has built and I don't want anyone to misconstrue. (laughs) Yeah. You know, internets like to misconstrue things sometimes. Yeah. That being said, you know, I feel like there's, like you're saying, there has to be a reason why she can't stop saying it over and Mm -hmm. over and over, you know, and there was another episode. I listened to it while I was working out yesterday because I was just like, well, all right, (laughs) because apparently Mm -hmm. I can't get enough Bethany. Yeah, right. (laughs) God, what am I doing? And something about the way she was speaking. Mm-hmm. And it, this comes from my place of feeling like I used to love Bethany because I thought, man, she mm-hmm. is a badass. That's the way I always felt about her. And Same. then there's, yeah. And it's just like this deterioration of the way she's treated other content creators, the way it's the devolvement of who she's always presented herself as by just kind of being a little unhinged on the internet, but maybe mm-hmm. that's just who she was. And we saw the edited version on Bravo. Yeah. Maybe that's all, you know, ooh, edited. Well, we did see plenty of unhinged moments. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> but something about the way she was saying, 
And I love it. I love that you guys just are, I'm getting some of the hate that Rachel's gotten in. I don't care. I love it. You oh just love talking about me. Keep talking about me. It, it almost struck me. I don't know why that I feel like Bethany is also that person that maybe makes fun of her fans that isn't, doesn't love those fans that she talks to because the way she's been hitting everyone in the comments, like, oh, you're so jealous of my success. Like, oh my God, I cannot believe a successful person would utter those words. Yeah. It's very Trump like that's something he does. And it's like, yeah, you don't, you're successful. You don't need to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and I also think come after me for that. No, I, I think too, part of it is like, I really wanted this first interview for Rachel Raquel to be like, mm -hmm. kind of like a safe place for her to really talk about what had happened. And I think that the, like, I, I always, I think Raquel should have gone on, or sorry, Raquel, Rachel, I know it kind of like, yeah, um, it's... Rachel, but I, I kind of think she should have gone on like, good morning America and talked to Gail King or something. Like, I think that. Absolutely. If I was on her team, I mean, it sounds like she doesn't want to be a public figure anymore as much. Um, but if I was on her team, I'd be like, you need to go on a more respected, like, you know, high level show. You, it has enough attention. I think these shows would yes. buy for something like that. And then go quiet and put out like a tell all book in like two years. And she could probably live off that money for like <laughs> the rest of her life. Um, Absolutely. I just think it's, this really fumbled. Yeah. It it fumbled hard because then she also says she's planning on starting her own podcast. And here's the thing. I don't – and I – listen, I will joke and do impressions of her shaky voice and I'm not l – let me just be serious for a second. I mm -hmm. think that it would give her so much anxiety to have yeah. to sit there and speak like that. We we saw she couldn't – remember, she, she couldn't even give a speech – Without yeah. James is feeding it to her. The girls on some, I don't know what they did. They had some bet or so, I can't remember. This was like yeah. last season, I think, or the season before. And she had to give she had a to speech. say a word, right? Like she had to say something vulgar or something. Yes. Was Just like a, yeah. a sentence or two. And yeah. she couldn't do that. So I can't imagine. That would seem like a miserable thing to do mm -hmm. for yourself in general. Like I hate doing math. I am not going to go into yeah. a career <laughs> doing math. I'm, trust me, you don't want me to. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't mm -hmm. equate well. That being said, with Rachel doing a podcast, I would like to know if you, let's say you're like, all right, guess I'm on your publicity team and we've mm -hmm. already fumbled this. Who do you think she should have on as guests? I know, obviously, who my first, if she didn't aim to get Monica Lewinsky on, whose platform is cyberbullying now, mm -hmm. girl, no one is working for you very well. Who? But aside, yeah. if, if you agree or disagree, who else do you think would be helpful to her cause? <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like if it would have to be like lighter, like if it was lighter, I think Monica Lewinsky would be a great alignment for her. Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I just, I never even really pondered like her actually doing a podcast because I think you're right. I don't really see her. I think she would have to be more of like a quiet introspective host that just lets the other people talk, which is sometimes those are like great podcasts too, is when someone's more of a listener. Mm. I, I think it would be more so hard for her to get people to come on her podcast. I don't know that people would want to align themselves with her right now which would be difficult. Um, I don't, I just don't see her. I just don't see it happening, but I could be wrong. I think you're right. I, I don't, don't really either. see her as a public speaker, but I do think the reason so many of these um, Bravo stars launch podcasts is because it's one of the only places now where they're unedited. Mm -hmm. I think they saw the success of like, what was it like two teas in a pod or something that Tamara from, Real Housewives yeah. of OC and then now Real Housewives of OC was vying to get her back because I think her star had kind of risen so mm -hmm. I think a lot of people saw that success and are like oh my god we want to have that leverage that kind of Tamara yeah. was able to have with Bravo after being let go well and that's the thing too that I will say I understand where Bethany is saying in this whole strike that she's trying to propose which you know it makes it difficult for any of these people to be hired anywhere after that and yeah I, you know, it's like 
you can't just go work in an office job after you've been screaming at your friends on television. Like that's just not really the way it typically ends up panning out. So I, there, that is fair. Like a podcast that's, I mean, listen, we all have podcasts. Yeah. We've all, (laughs) me and you both get, get in line. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and, but that's also a way for us to take our content into our own hands coming from being and trying to be a working actor in Los Angeles for 10 years. It, they would, people would be like, Oh, create your own content. And I'm like, do you understand how expensive it, it is to yeah. create a production yeah. podcasting? It's doable. Right. Yeah. Um, that being said, before, as I'm venturing off on that whole avenue, <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, going back to the reality reckoning mm-hmm. of it all, there are, is a we're going to say a rumor um I feel like Bethany already hinted at it on the episode before she had Rachel on which Mm -hmm. um looks like Vanity Fair has been working Mm -hmm. on we're going to say an expose um and it I it sounds like it's really aimed at Bravo I'm going to be immensely surprised if it's not uh very heavily aimed also at the Bachelor and Bachelorette franchises um I mean just from what we saw on that show Unreal uh the a woman who used to be a producer on The Bachelor uh, wrote that, yeah. and I just forgot her name. Um, I mean, obviously that was highly dramatized, but mm-hmm. a lot of it, from what I understand, is inspired by the true events of it. Yeah. So, it and I mean, people are saying it might be our next Me Too type of movement. Mm-hmm. Um, which you know, listen, I we need to hear people out if if these things really are happening, right? Yeah. That being said, um, how are you predicting the landscape of entertainment will be changing? Especially, I mean, we're not seeing very much of uh, very much progress with the WGA and SAG strikes. Yeah. Um, I mean, studios are not budging, but then if reality TV strikes, wow. Um, what is your prediction on what we're going to see in entertainment there? Yeah. And see, this is where I align with Bethany and I'm like, maybe her kind of crass approach is the right, is the thing that's going to get attention for this. Cause, um, and there was, I actually talk about this. Um, I did a thing with my friend. Um, we have a YouTube series called share your screen where we each week, one of us makes like a slideshow. And I did one on reality TV and kind of the exploitation of reality TV, which Sometimes I feel like I'm contributing because I'm a viewer. I mm-hmm. love reality TV. I always say it's like reality is stranger than fiction. Um, and I was doing research for it. There was an article that came out that lawyers representing Bethany and a handful of other reality stars sent a public legal letter to NBC and Bravo, essentially, you know, gearing up for potentially a lawsuit against them. Um, and I think that would align with maybe a Vanity Fair article that is coming out if, um, they're doing more of a deep dive. And I think that I'm always shocked at it. And it's not just NBC Bravo. It's almost like MTV has crazy things that have happened on their shows. Um, CBS, Tia, oh my gosh, TLC. I don't even like consider that reality TV. I'm like, that's just like crazy exploitation yeah um (laughs) yeah like 90 day fiance and like half the time like what if it's just like trafficking like you never know it's just crazy instances on especially early seasons um allegedly in my opinion but um Mm -hmm. (laughs) the reality reckoning I mean I was even looking at some episodes of Real Housewives where I was like and that one episode that stands out to me that isn't you know, criminal. So I think it's something I can like really publicly uh, speculate on and talk about is uh, that hey, I don't like her, but Vicky from Real House of Voce, mm-hmm. I always think about that one episode that aired when she found out her mom died. Mm. And I'm like, how, like, I, mm. it's one of mm-hmm. like the most difficult scenes in television I think and I'm like how Mm -hmm. I mean maybe she okayed them to air it but at what point as a camera crew do you just say like let's just put the cameras down like I don't know it's just I think that reality when people are on reality tv they're no longer seen as people we're also Mm -hmm. seeing um a couple things gearing up with Netflix right now and love is blind I'm actually hoping to interview um Nick Thompson from love is blind Mm. because he's kind of spearheading this but Mm -hmm. um 
the things that they would have to do in the pods, like there, there wasn't windows, so they didn't really know what time of day it was. Um, they never had uh, off time, so they were constantly working. And in um, in a video that Nick Thompson and one of the other guys uh, gearing up for the lawsuit uh, said is that allegedly Netflix told them they were contracted employees. So they didn't get, you know, you don't get those breaks every five hours, eight hours. You didn't get overtime pay. Um, so they were contracted employees. But then when they filed their taxes the following year, Netflix had uh, filed W-2s on their behalf which would make them full-time employees. So yeah. they said either Netflix lied to us or they lied to the IRS, but they were classified they weren't given 1099s. as- They weren't 1099s, oh. according to them, um, allegedly. So I do think that like reality stars, I, I think especially in America, were obsessed with fame and our gods are celebrities in some ways. And yet we like vehemently despise anyone who pursues fame. So I think reality stars fall in that bucket of they're, you know, vying for something that in America we're told is like the, you know, the new American dream is getting famous. Yeah. And if you're just there, but not quite there yet, you're like despised. And I think reality stars are dehumanized. Like the moment they're on a show, they're no longer seen as human beings, even after the show and when they're no longer public figures, it's still mm -hmm. kind of fair game, especially when you see shows you know, rebuying the rights. Like uh, Netflix just bought old seasons of Big Brother and me and my friend were watching old seasons and we're like, oh my God, like the crazy things that would happen. And I'm sure some people send hate to these people online. They were on television 12 years ago. So I, I just think yeah. it's all interesting, yeah. Absolutely, you know, speaking to that, I remember I used to love, now I'll see this is one that <laughs> I'm forgetting this one, Dance Moms. Oh my God, oh I my loved Dance God. Moms. Oh my God, same, but it was so bad. So Looking bad. Looking back, I'm like, what? Oh my God. So, so bad. These little girls. girls. Uh, I mean, um, I yeah. so like it what something that really stood out to me recently. I was just randomly scrolling TikTok and I saw Maddie Ziegler who's doing some sort of challenge where it was like, do your make full face of makeup in under three minutes. This girl, and she's, I think she's over 21 now. Yeah. She is shaking at the competition with herself. If you go watch it, and I, my heart was wow. like, oh my God, this little That's girl. So yeah. Yes. And I, it's interesting too, because I remember, so I used to work at this restaurant. I was a hostess because listen, you could not be an actor without working in some form of <laughs> service yes. at some point in your life. And I was working at this great restaurant. If you ever want some really delicious food in Studio City. Granville, oh my God, it's so good. Ooh. Their mac and cheese is too good. Mm -hmm. And I remember Holly and uh, Christy from Dance Moms come in and I was immediately like, oh my God, I know who you guys are. Yeah. And they were so sweet. And then I overhear, I mean, these girls who are at not three feet from them, straight up being like, I effing hate her. Oh my God. She's such a piece of shit. I mean, I know she could hear. And I was like this on what planet? <laughs> they don't I see them as human. They're not human. wild. Yeah. Well, and I will say from experience, a little insider tea on your pod. I don't think I've ever like said it publicly, but I Ooh. used to have a job. I work like I worked. I'm now content creator, but I worked full time in marketing and media for years. Mm -hmm. And um, my company that I was at one year interviewed Abby Lee Miller. And I will say one of the meanest people. Like there were people who like just just as it is on TV, there were grown cameramen that I worked with that refused to ever record with her again. And like oh crying. My God. Like it was bad. So in my opinion, um, I like it was just a bad experience. And so I can't imagine I, I remember after that was when I never I vowed to never watch Dance Bombs again because I'm like, if that's what like the team went through that are grown people working in corporate America, how were those girls treated? If that's how she treated these people, it was wild. So Horrible. I truly believe everything they went through was not just for show. I think that was genuinely how they were treated. That is, it's like, you, 
it's almost like you feel like whenever, maybe it's just with actors on scripted shows, but whoever is playing the biggest villain, they typically are the sweetest human being on the yeah. planet. I, so it's Rachel almost McAdams, like- Rachel McAdams, Regina George, yeah. Yes, exactly. Like they are the best human beings. And it, <laughs> that's why it's like, oh, uh, when you, maybe reality stars, I mean, we have to remember there is the reality aspect to yeah. it. I mean, I, and this was a million years ago, um, when uh i hope well we'll see if i'm allowed to hopefully i'm allowed to talk about this uh, surely i am um when i uh, kane well it's jonathan kane that he goes by but kane gillespie um he's been on he was just on project runway all stars mm, okay. and um he was on project runway many years ago and back when i did beauty pageants he was my pageant oh. gown designer so they there it was tlc that was doing a pilot for him called gown crazy and i will never forget standing in there because I was one of his models so we were just a part of some of the filming and everything and I a girl I knew I'm you know she's not a public figure so I'm not going to mention her name but she worked for him and I remember the producers trying to get her and another one of his assistants to start talking shit on another girl and the girl that I had known since junior high was like uh yeah no I'm actually not gonna do that because they were like aren't you so annoyed that we'll say Brittany was like taking forever like oh my god she should have been doing this and that I think you should talk about that and she <laughs> the girl was just like no um I actually don't have a problem with her at all and, like, so, and then they voted her out next week no they're like, right get exactly get him out uh, yeah so it's just when you see some of it firsthand it's just kind of like yeah. there there is the nudging and the pushing we know that all happens but like People are still in control of innately how they respond is basically my yeah. point there. And it kind of comes full circle to, well, you know, you can't give someone a full monster edit without some monster material, basically. Yeah. And I think, and I think, sorry to jump in. I think that's also no. two points really quick. One, I think that's what makes Vanderpump Rules. Like one of my favorite shows is I always say like shows that are filming people that knew each other before cameras ever started filming them like vpr their dynamics were so true and that's why the boring seasons are very boring because it was just like that's truly what they were doing at that time like yes. they and i think it's why season eight is like one of the worst seasons because they try to insert people in but the reason that vpr like that cast has more power over that show than even the most famous real housewives real housewives get swapped in and out every like three seasons but VPR has stayed the same. And they, of course, some people have gotten let go and stuff, but like that cast is like a core group through and through and they have history. And I think that's what makes the dynamic so fascinating. And then also, sorry, mm -hmm. I just remembered one of your questions mm -hmm. too about the strike. I will say if reality TV goes on strike, it will be completely a shutdown in the entertainment industry because last time there was a strike, was in 2007, 2008. That's when we mm -hmm. saw, um, you know, Real Housewives of New York, Real Housewives of Atlanta, the Bravo yeah. franchise really um, catapulted that year. We also saw the same year as the strike was later that year is when Keeping Up with the Kardashians launched. So they really rely on reality TV during these strikes. So if they go on strike, it'd be donezo. But anyway, sorry, I had to add those two notes. I just remembered. No please no apologies necessary i can sometimes i start talking and then I, I can talk myself into circles sometimes you have to be like caitlin you had a point and i have a point as well can you get to it <laughs> oh please do not <laughs> no apologies for butting in it has to happen sometimes <laughs> because here's here's the thing too with that like because we are going to see a whole shutdown in the industry if this does happen and you know we're we're preparing for it we're as best we can that being said Obviously, the first thought is going to be turning their industry is going to content creators. And yeah. along with that, when I tell you that these studios and these ugh, companies do not care, I have so publicly said over and over that I'm in SAG. I am receiving emails. Now, had this been, I don't know, 10 months ago, I'd have been like, hell yeah. <laughs> Are you interested in working with networks and streamers and studios, ma'am? Not only, I, not only am I not allowed to, like, how yeah. are you still doing this? So they really, they don't care. They're, they're going to find a way. Yeah. My thought and my question is, obviously, we're going to see it turn to content creators. Do you think, 
there is anyone that we should be watching that, I mean, I know like Addison Wright, she's probably already in SAG actually now that I'm saying that. She is. I'm not even going to question it. <laughs> um, so is there someone we should be watching that you think could be, or even people that you see interacting, hopefully aside from the Mormon mom talk moms, yeah. I could see that happening too. Um, group of friends, anyone that we should just kind of watch if we're suddenly without content that you think will have great content during that time if this totally goes through? Yeah. I mean, I think we're obviously going to see like a lot more, for example, podcasting get more viewers because I, I think I've, I've kind of coined this term a couple months ago and it was before the strike even happened, but um, I think with TikTok leaning into podcasting and longer videos, 10 minute videos, um, I really called it like, I think people have short form fatigue where everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, like I, I remember when Vine came out, everyone's like, oh, wow, like humans are so stupid now because their attention pan span is only seven seconds. And I'm like, actually, uh, it takes a lot more brain power to have to every seven seconds process a new face, a new topic, new dialect, new captions, new title, new hashtags, new comments. And then the next seven seconds, a new type, a new title, new face. New People don't want to mm -hmm. do that anymore. They want to lean into more long form. Um, and I think that now that like TV shows, movies are on strike and not creating content, um, they're going to turn to podcasting. They're going to turn to reality shows. I think it doesn't sound like reality TV, like it could go to a strike, but I also think that what's hard about a reality strike is there's so many people who want to be on reality TV that like, if one person's like, no, I'm striking, they'll be like, okay, we have a hundred people that we can call right now and replace you. Exactly. So I do think reality TV will remain. Um, but I do think that what I, what with more of like the A-list celebrities, what I think might happen is we're going to see a lot more of those crossover celebrities that do acting and singing go more into music again. I don't think it's a shock mm. that Miley selena and ariana are putting out new music next friday because they can't mm. ariana can't act on the wicked set right now so they're going to go back into music in the meantime and i think that we're going to see a lot more new music in the next couple months and specifically we're going to see a lot more storytelling through music videos i think music mm. videos are going to be a way that these actors and celebrities are able to kind of get their face out there still and get booked and it's not violating the strike so we're going to see kind of like Taylor Swift did that 10 minute all too well movie. We're going to see a ton of that in the next couple months Ooh. from all types of artists and genres as they cannot be on TV sets and booked for roles right now. That see, and I remember you speaking on this, like I, y'all, I really do. will I'll send your videos to like some of Aww. my friends and I'm like, get ready for the longer form. I, that listen, yeah. I've been just paying attention because you are very accurate in what you predict. And so that's really interesting about the music videos too. That's I, yeah, because they're, they don't fall under union regulations at all. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're obviously going to see more of our A-list actors doing commercials because yeah, like got to make their money, keep that house, you know, out in Capri, yeah. but a lot of um, perfume collabs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone's gonna be the face of Lexus, lines. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which sucks for people like me and Sag who <laughs> would love to do those <laughs> yeah. commercials. Um, so that but kind I of do, puts all yeah. of us right back down. Mm -hmm. I do think audiences though are going to start like again, 2007 when during the last strike. Guess what app blew up? YouTube, like there's going to be people turning to internet celebrities to kind of mm. pacify them as well. And, um, and I not even just pacify, they're going to continue to like enjoy them even after. Um, but people are looking for that long form content. We haven't even felt the actual effects of the strike yet. It's going to happen in the fall. It's going to happen in the winter when the new shows aren't coming out. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to see a ton of more, of course, reality shows as well, just starting to pop up left and right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I'm really interested to see how we all end up responding. Um, yeah. and I have a feeling absolutely about the music video point was I, that, that hit me hard. Okay. That was, a good, oh. good one. um, <laughs> I'm just like, I, I see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, oh my gosh. But if Ariana puts her new, is he her boyfriend? Oh, we're not going to talk about it. Okay. Oh um, yeah. The, the guy, the SpongeBob guy. SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
what a mess. That was, Listen, uh, I mean, she, all of she it, flew under the radar with that. Well, all the con- celebrity controversies that happened since then, I was like, girl, this was this was a warm up lap. Like, she's probably like, oh, thank God. Like, <laughs> the attention's not on her now. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's that's the thing too. Um, and I'll bring us a little more full circle here, which is the biggest difference, uh, well, we'll say two differences, but the main one uh is that Monica Lewinsky versus Rachel is that mm-hmm. Monica was not seeking a public life. Yeah. Rachel was. Mm-hmm. Did she sign up for some of the things that happened? No. Um, mm-hmm. but she did sign up for a lot of the things that did happen. So there's that. Um also Monica was not friends with Hillary. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we're calling best friends, friends, acquaintances, good friends, whatever, she didn't know her. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. That's it. So there, there was that difference, but you know, I think I, I just, I, I hope that we all don't end up, um, really regretting any treatment of Rachel. I, I thought we were going to, and then this podcast really just blew blew that um blew right out of my mind. Again. um mm-hmm. yeah so i'm i'm hoping for her sake she will tell her actual story because she didn't tell any story if there is even any story left for her to tell i don't know that mm-hmm. there maybe is um i i don't know i guess we're going to find I, out from vanity fair yeah i mean i think that this is you know a podcast for a different day but i know he's a fan favorite mm-hmm. and in some ways i love him but and i hope it's you never want this to be true you never want it to be anything someone's gone through but if the speculation around james kennedy is mm-hmm. true i think mm-hmm. that it would give raquel a lot more understanding and sympathy if the things that kristen dowdy has alluded to mm-hmm. and like i just hope that that's just never something you want anyone to go through so i hope it doesn't come to that um, but I think that would open up a whole other can of worms that would make Scandaval look like child's play. So I think that would be the only time Raquel would ever maybe come back into the public eye to like actually talk about it and hopefully not mm. on Bethany's podcast about Bethany. And she was just like a side character. I, I think that's probably what it's like just being in Bethany's life in general. Everyone is a side yeah. character. It felt like she <laughs> was interviewing in Bethany. <laughs> I'm like, girl. I know. I was like, girl, what is happening? Like, uh, who is who is the special guest here? Because yeah, I don't even get it anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, friends, I I feel like we could sit here and talk forever about this because mm-hmm. um, there's just so much more to even dissect. So at some point, I will have to have you back on again once Please, we get. Yes, this. I love this. We we know. Um. So thank you so much again for joining Coco. You can find her at TikTok, uh, mm-hmm. Instagram. Uh, YouTube, she has a show on there, share your screen, Mm -hmm. as well as your podcast and tell everyone where they can find your podcast and that as well. Honestly, my biggest thing is, um, I would say my TikTok, Kokomoko, you can find like all my links there. And then my pod ahead of the curve where I interview people and I talk about like upcoming media trends, my thoughts on stuff going on in pop culture. Um, But yeah, if you guys find me on TikTok, then you can literally find everything else in my bio. So that's probably the easiest. I'll be linking all of that into the show notes as well, thank friends. You. Well, yeah, thank you so much for joining. And um, I will see you all soon.